Hello everyone and welcome back to Chili Chats. Today's episode is a really important one for me because it is the first time I interview a published author. In today's episode I interview John DeSimone who is the author of The Road to Delano. Now why today's episode is quite an important one for me personally is because I I've always been interested in finding out the motivation behind a novel, for example, from the author's perspective. I find that anything you read, whether it's a newspaper column or a poem, a novel, a short story, that's always open to interpretation and often is a projection of you your personality, your character, how you read things, how you interpret things, how you translate things. And so it's quite interesting to actually hear from the author themselves, what was their motivation behind writing the novel? What did they want readers to pick out from the novel? Or how did they want readers to feel and to react from reading their novel? How did they create the characters? Where did their inspiration derive from in the first instance? And this is an opportunity to find out exactly that. So I will let John De Simone take it away. Well, um, first of all, uh, Mel, thank you for having me on your show. And um, I really appreciate it. The Road to Delano is a historical novel. Uh, In my uh, journey to become a writer, I I taught um, freshman writing at a university for several years. And um, what I mean by journey, to become a full-time writer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, most writers are always doing it um, until they, something works good enough that they can make a living at it. And um, I read um, a book in, in preparing for the classes on um, the history of civil disobedience. And in there was an essay, uh, excerpts from, one from Socrates to Martin Luther King, but one of the essays was on Cesar Chavez. And I live in California, you're in London, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. So uh, many of your listeners may not be aware of it, but uh, aware of him. But in the uh, 60s, he led a strike of grape workers and there were many people working with him, but he was the, the face of the movement. Right. And, um, uh, and the field workers were mainly, um, camp, they call them campesinos, uh, peons, uh, poor itinerant uh, um, Mexican-Americans, Filipinos, um, some others mixed in, Indians. Uh, there was many immigrant communities here in, Southern, in Central California. And... Um, what he did differently was he led a strike based on nonviolence. In other words, they would not use violent tactics to, uh, to uh, revenge themselves on the growers when the growers began to be violent. Long history of violence in, that, in, that, in this community in Central yeah. California. So um, in 1968, things were getting, the strike had been on for three years. Uh, things were getting really heated up. The growers were getting angry. The field workers were getting restless. And uh, they, you know, were living on handouts and, and um, not working because they came out of the fields. Mm-hmm. And um, violence began to get ramped up. And there was rumors that some of the uh, Chavez uh, union members were going to get guns and start retaliating mm-hmm. because they were being beaten on the roads. They were being harassed. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, trucks would drive by and run over their, you know, run them off the uh, edge of the road when they're picketing. It was, you know, it was usual harassment tactics that went, mm-hmm. that go on. And so what he did is he had a, str- a fast for nonviolence. Now a fast is different okay. from a, um, a fast for nonviolence is different from a hunger strike. Okay. Could you just, um, sort of explain the difference sure sure you know um when people um go on hunger strikes they're protesting against their overlords 
the people who have power over them. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, prisoners in jail who are protesting an unjust imprisonment will go on a hunger strike. They, they're striking against what the uh, authorities are doing to them. Mm -hmm. A fast is more of a religious exercise. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more penitential. It causes you to look inward. And what he called for his fast was for his people to stop and reflect and think about how far they've come and to um, and to not and to, and to practice nonviolent. It takes discipline and creativity to practice nonviolence. Mm -hmm. So I set my and I it was a historic moment. It had never the fast had been, you know, Gandhi's fam famous for um, you know, his nonviolent tactics and and Martin Luther King was famous and there was others, but um, Cesar Chavez was the first to use it in a labor action. What? He wasn't protesting what the government was doing. He wasn't trying to overthrow the government. He wasn't trying to overthrow the authorities. He was trying to restrain his own people from acting violently. So I set my story. I thought it was a historic and courageous action. Absolutely. Yeah, he fasted for 25 days and the violent talk among his the followers, the, the union members uh, just stopped. Right. And if it hadn't stopped, the strike would have failed. Yes. Because the moment grower, the moment the uh, strikers would have uh, retaliated, say got weapons and shot back when they were shot at, mm -hmm. the uh, sheriff and the National Guard would come in and arrest them. That's the history. That's what happened. Yes. And so I set my story around this fast. It happened in February of 1968. It took place for 25 days. And I put some uh, fictional characters around it. And I thought, the, you know, I'm teaching students, and I thought, what, what do high school students think of this wow. fact? So I picked one character was, is a, um, Jack is a son of a grower, and one character, Adrian Sanchez, is the son of a field worker. Can and, I stop you there? Can I ask how you sort of came up with the characters? Well, um, you know, Character building is a process for, for most writers. For me, it certainly was. Yeah. Um, one thing that uh, I, I, I don't live far from the city of Delano. Okay. And so I drove up there and I met some people and I interviewed them. And interviewing is a casual conversation at this point. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know they grew up in Delano. They were at high school. What was it like? I'm thinking yeah. of writing a book about it. And so... I began to get these stories of uh, different stories and I merged them into Adrian and he's a Hispanic uh, and all of the characters are, are citizens. At this point in California, there is not a struggle between illegal immigrants and legal immigrants. Mm -hmm. These are all uh, green carters or citizens that have been there, born there or, or have been naturalized, but mm -hmm. still they're treated like sub-citizens okay okay they're not given the same rights as as other workers um for instance you know in your country and in my country if someone works for wages they get paid into some type of unemployment insurance some type of disability insurance some type of days off um you know a sick leave mm -hmm. uh, maybe a health insurance plan well the field workers had none of that of course no rights nothing they got their their wage if they get sick they go home they say goodbye mm -hmm. okay so it's a it, it's a very risky job but it's the only job they they have at that point so you asked me how i did the characters jack is actually based on a uh fairy tale okay because i wanted his arc to be a coming of age story right so you have a coming of age story in other words, his coming of age is the moral development of his conscience. And that's what some reviewers have called it. They've called it a, a thriller with a conscience. And for Adrian, it's um, 
they're both, both of these characters are high school students. They're both seniors. They're both star athletes. And um, they both have, are confronted in various ways with the idea of practicing nonviolence. Right. And so that's the moral dilemma that I got them into. And I think that the strongest fiction in my thinking um, takes the characters and puts them into morally dangerous ground where they have to make a variety of choices. Their life could go either way as a result of it. Mm -hmm. And high school certainly is one of those times, isn't it? Absolutely, and, yeah. Our lives can go either way. <laughs> yes, and, uh, very true. So long story short, that's kind of the, the milieu, the background of the story. And uh, I just filled in everything through research, just mm -hmm. a lot of research. And what was, your, what was your inspiration for writing about this particular subject? Obviously, you said you live quite near, near to... Delano. Well, it was it was reading that essay. Um, so in this book on the mm -hmm. on the history of civil disobedience, I read an essay. There's essays from Socrates down to Martin Luther King on how they used civil disobedience to overturn society or to change society. Okay. And um, you could say that Caesar Chavez's fast for nonviolence was a form of civil disobedience. Um, you know, Socrates, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't um, uh, compromise his morals and his, his standards and his um, method of inquiry. So they made him drink the hemlock, you know, and he, mm -hmm. he made that moral choice. Um, so in reading the essays on Cesar Chavez and how this individual, this man uh, with an eighth grade education, um, changed the course of agricultural history, labor relations in California through the practice of something that's mainly attributed to martyrs and, and political movements and great preachers. Uh, and it happened right here in California, stirred my imagination. <laughs> so as I read about him and his life, and how he dedicated himself to a life of simplicity and poverty to help his fellow workers. I mean, he had alternatives. He was a smart guy. And, um, you know, he, he could have moved out into the middle class, and he decided he did not want to do that. He wanted to identify with this very impoverished uh, group of workers and see if they could better their lives. And so, I mean... To me, he's a cultural hero. Absolutely. Yeah. And taking all of this, so you've done a lot of research, obviously, a lot of background um, sort of studying of, of the characters um, that you wanted to in, implement into your novel. I mean, could you talk about your writing process, how you sort of brought all of those ideas all together into one place? Yeah. You know, the process for, for everyone... Um, is a little different, but in some ways, you know, for all novelists, it's, it's the, it's the same. Mm -hmm. And that is you, you have to be able to write a first draft, just think it through and go scene by scene, uh, so that you come to some conclusion and then the real art, that's art. That is art. Get, getting mm -hmm. it, getting it down in a first draft. But the art of the second draft is to revise it in such a way that it looks like you knew what you were doing all along. Right. Have you ever read a book and you go, wow, that author really nailed it? Well, they probably went through four or five drafts. I went through at least five drafts of the book. Yeah. So Over how long was the, the whole process of creating The Road to Delano? Researching it probably you know, a year, writing the first draft another year. Um, I write slowly. Mm -hmm. And writing subsequent drafts, revising it, revising it, um, took another year or two. Uh, I worked with editors. I worked with critique groups. I worked in workshops all over the country. And I worked with, um, I have my own critique group. 
I burned out all my friends reading it. At that point, <laughs> at, at that point, you have to you have to branch out and you have to get beyond you know um, your fellow writers that are close to you mm -hmm. and move beyond that. So um, I worked a lot of with uh, writing groups and writing conferences across the country. Uh, as I mentioned in my bio, I won a, a, a Mailer scholarship and I lived on Cape Cod for a month okay. next to um, Mail Norma Mailer's house where he ran, a, uh, after he died, he bequeathed his house to a foundation. And I workshopped that book every day for a month uh, mm -hmm. with a group of writers. It was a very intense um very intense time and I practically rewrote it during that month and then you know then it took um, uh, time to find an agent and then it took another time to sell it and and I launched it on March 10th a week before they closed down all the bookstores here in California <laughs> just just in time then huh <laughs> just in time yeah yeah but we can get your book from Amazon, is that right? Absolutely. It's on Amazon in every country that Amazon is on, is in. Um, I've had readers in India email me. I've had readers uh, in Australia. Um, certainly some from Britain. Would love to have more. And uh, yeah, it's on Amazon. It's on Book Depository, which uh, is distributed all over the world. Right. And uh, are all your bookstores closed there in England too? Um, not yet, actually. <laughs> I think not yet. So. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I've seen it on some of the websites of some of the larger bookstores uh, in in Britain. So, um, indie bound. Uh, if if someone wants to support the independent book uh, booksellers, uh, you can find it on indie bound, and they'll tell you which books. Fantastic. Bookstores close to them, uh, IndieBound does a zip code uh, search. So, um, and my website is just my name, John D Simone dot com. D E S I M O N E. Fantastic. And um, so, with regards to the Road to Delano, obviously it is a fictional book, but it's based on real events. And that's why it's called a, and that's why I. I set it in the genre of historical fiction. Yes. So there's there's um, the actual characters of Cesar Chavez shows up in the book. Yes. Um, some other some other characters from the sixties. Um, Have you had any uh, reaction from the Chavez family? Yes. Yes. Great that you ask. Yes. Um, so in in writing it, the the publisher said told me that it would be really great if we could get a forward from one of the Chavez family. So I wrote a letter to um, Paul Chavez, who runs the Cesar Chavez Foundation. That's his, yes. one of his sons. I had a read of that, actually. And um, I didn't hear from him for a couple of months. And then I got a call one day from Mark Grossman. Now, Mark Grossman works for the foundation and went ahead and um, he went ahead and read it, and um, and Paul Chavez had never written a forward for a novel, so Mark did it, and Mark helped me quite a bit. In the, he read the final draft, we made some more changes, and then and then a few weeks before it launched, uh, I was able to have lunch uh, at uh, Keene in Keene, where the uh, Caesar Chavez Foundation has an office. And with Paul Chavez and Andre Chavez, who is Cesar Chavez's grandson. And there's a picture of us um, at the monument um, on my Instagram page. Oh, I love it. I have to have a look at that. Is that also, yeah. well, we'll have to follow you, um, John D. Simon as well? G John D. Simone, 1969. 1969 is the year I graduated from high school. There were several John D. Simones on there, so that's the only one I could get. Um, and it was a great meeting. And what has happened in 2012 during the administration of Barack Obama, he declared, he went to Keene. Keene is, is just outside Bakersfield, 
which is in Central California, up in the Tehachapi's a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's, they built a, the headquarters for the foundation and the union there in some land that was given to them. And Caesar and the um, Barack Obama administration declared a portion of it a national historic monument. So mm -hmm. that's where Cesar Chavez and his wife Helen are buried. And there's a tour of his office. They've turned his actual office into a, a tour. You can take the tour and you can see his office and wow. it, his granddaughters uh, run it. Um, it's, it's a, uh, was really a stirring moment. We had lunch and then he gave us a tour. So, um, and I've heard through others that he, and I gave him some books for their little bookstore. And so he is showing it around to others. <clears throat> Fantastic. What yeah. do you hope that readers get from the story, John? What do I hope? Yeah. In terms of well, the message, you know. What I hope they get from the story is the, just how important um, this man's moral stand was to a group of people, a disenfranchised people, but also what it takes to make uh, big moral choices. And the, the two characters, Jack and Adrian, who are fictional, um, are faced with a series of choices that they have to make to, um, you know, to, to go on their path of life. And, and that's the tagline I have for the book. The Road to Delano is the path that Jack and Adrian have to take uh, to find their destiny, their strength, and their duty. And so it's about destiny. It's about duty. It's about having moral courage in the face of, of when there's a lot of social pressure to go a different way. Definitely. And this is what makes certain people stand out as, uh, to me, in my mind, as heroic. Mm -hmm. is they, they have the courage to, to make choices that are against the mainstream. Breaking the status quo, as it were, perhaps. Yeah, you know, challenging the status quo. Where would our culture be if, if people in our history, Britain as well as America, uh, did not challenge the status quo? Definitely. Uh, you know, our societies, our free and democratic societies, that we that we enjoy and that we uh, celebrate are the result in, in a lot of ways of, of the men and the women who um, didn't see eye to eye with, you know, the governing um, bodies. Certainly the American revolution was that way. And mm -hmm. as Thomas Jefferson said, you know, we have a revolution just about every generation, mm -hmm. something new, someone new or some group new, new group rises up to um, exercise their freedoms and that certainly has been the history of britain too of course yeah um and in in countries that are known as authoritarian the moral standards i mean the moral courage is is celebrated momentarily but then it's extinguished i think the most graphic picture that everyone can can um call to mind is that picture in Tiananmen Square when that individual stood in front of that tank. Mm -hmm. And we know more than likely what happened to him. Yeah. yeah. That's what happens uh, in an absolute, in a, in a society ruled by an absolute ruler when someone takes a moral stand. Uh, but we're blessed to live in democracies. And so that's why Cesar Chavez could do what he did. Mm -hmm and why Martin Luther King could do what he did, and even what Gandhi could do what he did. Absolutely. So John, just before we go, um, are you working on any other novel at the moment? Well, I'm fleshing out a sequel, which I think would be an exciting book. Mm. And I'm also researching uh, a book set during the American Revolution which I think is an epic time in our history. Absolutely. And, uh, and the American Revolution and um, the revolution that happened quietly and silently over many centuries in Britain 
um, the separation of powers in Britain led up to uh, what happened in the American Revolution. So our countries are tied at the hip in so many ways mm -hmm. that um, I don't think the common citizen really understands. So I hope my books enlighten people, um, mm -hmm. bring a, a bit of history to them, um, to their to their understanding of what it what it takes. Well, how do we get where we are today? So many people, I particularly Americans, don't really uh, have an appreciation for what it took to get the free institutions that we have today. Absolutely. To be honest with you, John, I did not know anything about um, the Chavez family before speaking to you. Um, so it's definitely enlightened me, and I I definitely appreciate that. So thank you. Well, I, I appreciate you, Mel, taking the time to to discuss the book and talk about it. So thank you very much. No worries. That is it for today, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you once again for tuning in to Chitty Chats podcast. And don't forget to check out John's website. That's www.johndesimone.com and his Instagram, which is John De Simone 1969. Thank you. Have a lovely day.